This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. All right, welcome all. So glad you can join us for another edition of the Farm Monitor. As always, we have got a lot of good stories to share with you today, including one that is very powerful. Yeah, as in Georgia power. Coming up, the preparations being made in the event of yet another natural disaster here in Georgia and the new products and communication tools for using during severe weather. Also on the show, is there some good news on the horizon when it comes to trade relations with China? My cousin Sonny and David Perdue say yes, a more fair trade deal is a possibility and then later. Well, hey everybody, Ranger Nat coming up. You know, you may look out across your field and see some of these dirt mounds like you see here to my right and may wonder if it's fire ants, but this month I'm gonna show you how there's a little rodent that makes this little burrow under the ground and why you should be concerned about protecting this little guy. I'll dig into the whole story. That and so much more starts now on the Farm Monitor. A check of your favorite weather app shows we haven't even reached the middle of hurricane season and already there's been a good bit of activity. As we all know, hurricanes can cause a lot of problems and here in Georgia, those problems are typically in the form of power outages. At its recent hurricane summit, Georgia Power showcased what all goes into getting the power restored, as John Holcomb reports. When the rain and high winds start to come in, usually the calls to EMCs do as well. Trees and limbs fall on power lines and everything goes dark. But thanks to Georgia Power's preparedness, they are often way ahead of Mother Nature and are ready to help get the power back on to wherever needs help in the state. They'll ask us to supply the resources that they don't have readily so that we can make sure that we get them quicker and they can focus on the things that are closer to home, focus on the parts of the business that they've got their arms around. Georgia Power, like most businesses, has really learned how social media is a great communication tool. They even created this social media center that is staffed with personnel that work around the clock during a storm to help get information to customers. During a storm, we may have 10, 20, 30 people in this room uh, setting up at extra stations and being able to handle the load of all these uh, customer questions and getting out the information they need. Of course, having a staff dedicated to giving people information is important, but you also need people on the ground that are dedicated to getting the power restored. Georgia Power has just that, and it's something they put a lot of focus on and really is where the majority of their resources go when the lights do go out. One of the things we want to do is, is try to get our crews as close to where the damage is as we possibly can. That's the key to shorten the restoration period. Uh, in the past, we would have had them in hotels and had to bus them for an hour to get back and forth to the state, to the work. In order to do that, they have started setting up thousand man sites. They had a demo site set up at their headquarters for the summit and let us walk through the site to get a better look. So what we have today is, is kind of a simulation of our mini base camps. Typically we will set these up in thousand man sites. Uh, so first piece of equipment we in was, was in our mobile command center. In there that gives us our communications hub back up to the storm center. And we have full satellite up, uplink, we've got internet, we've got satellite TV, and it's also the meeting place for all our leadership to meet and dispatch work out of. Uh, so that's the first building we're in. The second one we came in today was this catering trailer. This particular unit can actually produce 3,000 meals at one time. Um, and so we'll typically with the crews when they're on a site, we'll do a hot breakfast, a box lunch, and then do a hot meal in the evening when they get in. Uh, the second bunch of equipment we went through was the laundry trailer and the shower trailer. Typically on a thousand man site, we will have three of the shower trailers and we'll have one of the laundry trailers to support that site. Those shower trailers typically have 20 to 24 heads in them to support the guys that are on that site. And then the last piece of equipment we went in was one of our 36 bed sleeper units. That's a three bunk unit with a six by six bed in it. It has privacy curtains, uh, lighting, and charging outlets inside the, the each one of the cots. Reporting in Atlanta for the Farm Monitor, 
um, John Holcomb. Thank you, John. Meantime, back home again in Georgia. Sonny and David Perdue returning to their roots, so to speak. The two cousins making the rounds throughout the state recently, talking about everything from the farm bill to the president's trade tariffs on China. We caught up with them during their stop at the UGA Griffin campus, where they got a first-hand look at the school's state-of-the-art turf grass and weed science facility. As you know, uh, turf and horticulture is a big industry, ag industry in Georgia, just like timber is. They're all crops. One has a different life, life cycle than the other, but the green industry in Georgia is alive and well, and we're happy to be here. As you can look, we just got a new free trade agreement with South Korea. That happened in months. With China, it's going to take much longer. Japan, one of our greatest trading allies, we don't have a free trade agreement with them either. So this is going to take some time, but I think the first thing that could happen is a relief of the tariff pressure that would lead to uh, these direct one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations. Getting fresh, locally grown produce is now easier than ever for consumers in restaurants around the Albany area as Flint River Fresh is bringing the farm to them. Damon Jones takes a look at this operation and tells you why it's a benefit for both the farmers and the community. It's been a passion project for Plains native Fredondo Jackson, also known as Farmer Frito, to provide fresh, locally grown fruits and vegetables to underserved communities. That's why day in and day out he buys, packs, and delivers produce from local farmers throughout rural areas as part of his Flint River Fresh program. We are a, a nonprofit here established in, in Albany, Georgia, and our mission is to increase access to fresh produce throughout southwest Georgia. And so what we do are create opportunities to work directly with the farmers and to bring their produce directly to the consumers through uh, just different programs that we have in place. Among the many places you will find Fredondo are pop-up stands, farmers markets, churches, and even restaurants, as they're quickly seeing the benefits of using produce grown right in their community. And the chefs love the freshness of it being local, the quality of it being local, and also being able to like tell the story of where the produce and things come from. So to see on a menu, here is some, some collard greens that are from Baker's Farm in like Norman Park. Or here are some squash that are from Evergreen Produce here in Adel, Georgia. And so we use that as, a, as an opportunity to show people about increasing access to fresh food, but also to educate them on the, the closeness of freshness, right? Ag education is one of the pillars of the Flint River Fresh program as they team with farms within a 75-mile radius of Albany. That means it's not a long trip for those looking to check out the farms their food comes from. So to, to make it really hyper-local, to increase direct access, but then also by having these farms so close in proximity, we're able to promote these farms and give an opportunity for a, a person, a family, or a church group or a school group to go out and visit these farms and location so they have more of a direct connection of their food and how it was grown. Having fresh produce so readily available also encourages a healthier diet as people are more likely to eat it for one reason. It tastes better, but then also when you minimize the distance that your produce has to travel, you're increasing the nutritional value of what you're eating. And so as we think about the, this climate where we know we have like health issues, hypertension, diabetes, um, cancer, whatever, go on and go on, some of that can be minimized just through like a small change in your diet. Because the last thing we want is for people to make an excuse why they can't eat healthy, especially in this region that we're in, because in southwest Georgia, most of, we are surrounded by fresh produce that's available year-round, 12 months out the year. While this program is growing at a fast rate, Fredondo isn't looking to slow down anytime soon. So, so the overall goal for this program is for it to develop to where there are food hubs or, or many food centers that are located in underserved rural communities throughout southwest Georgia. Reporting from Albany, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Hey everybody, Ranger Nick. On the other side of the break, I'm hanging out in the Longleaf Pine ecosystem looking at rodents that live under the ground here, and you're not going to want to miss why you should care about these little guys. That's after this. Hi, I'm Bryce Froland. I'm currently serving as a 2018-2019 state FFA president, and I'm from the Perry FFA chapter. Being elected Georgia FFA state president was just a great opportunity, one of my favorite memories so far in life. And I think it's a big legacy because there's been some great people before me, but I also think that title of president 
doesn't make me any better than any FFA member or any other state officer. I'm right there with you. I just have, I'm, I'm here to serve Georgia FFA and its members, and I think that's really what that title means, is to serve. To learn more about the National FFA organization, log on to FFA.org. The farmers, 1800s, they didn't have Google like we do now, so they did. They had no idea. They just started growing their cotton, um, and through plowing and tilling, they exposed that sand. And so, within about 20 years after they started, they started seeing um, four to five foot gullies forming. Um, now that's become 150 feet deep and 300 feet wide. The canyon keeps getting bigger, um, but it keeps getting wider. It's not getting any deeper because it's actually eroded away so much that we've hit the water table. So if you go into the bottom of the canyon, you'll see there's always water in the bottom of the canyon. Um, but we still lose three to five feet of canyon wall every year. So the canyon's about 300 feet wide now, but that's an estimate. Um, it's been around for about 200 years now and it just keeps getting bigger. There is roughly over a thousand acres of park property. The park is a thousand acres big. Um, the canyons take up 300 acres. There are 16 different canyons, but if you come out, then you can only go into nine of them. Um, if you do the seven mile loop, we have a seven mile loop and a three mile loop. If you go on the seven mile loop, you're actually able to see some of the other canyons, um, but you can't go down into them. So only nine of them are accessible, but of those nine, um, there's plenty to see. It's not made of stone. Um, like we talked about earlier, it's nothing but sand. So it's all sandy soil. So when you go down in there, um, you'll see different colors of sand and you'll see clay, primarily kaolin and um, that red Georgia clay. It's primarily hiking. We don't allow any type of ATVs or um, biking down into the canyon because everyone always asks. <laughs> um, but it's mostly hiking. There's lots of animals to see. A lot of people come out here for birding. Um, we have some special plants that are down in the bottom of the canyon, the Plumley Fazelia. We have botanists who come, who have come from all over the world just to see um, that flower because it only blooms. It's the only azalea that blooms in the fall. Um, and we have the largest wild stand and it actually grows in the bottom of the canyon. And one of the coolest things that we do out here, we have an astronomy night that's hosted by the Coca-Cola Space Science Center from Columbus, Georgia, and they come out and they have actually made us one of their um, dark sky locations. We don't have any light pollution out here, so you can actually see the Milky Way across the night sky, which is really cool. And then if you're down here, you can actually visit the visitor center. Um, there's lots of great information that they can tell you down there. And we offer guided hikes every single weekend um, at 10 a.m. and 2 p.m on Saturdays and Sundays with a um, naturalist who will take you down into the canyon and tell you a little bit more about it. Well, this month, Ranger Nick channels his inner Carl Spackler, the world-famous greenskeeper from the movie Caddyshack, who was obsessed with capturing and eliminating that, yes, adorable but destructive gopher. Yeah, but in this case, Nick wasn't trying to harm the gopher. He was more concerned about protecting it and teaching us the many benefits it could have on the ecosystem. Is that not the cutest face you've ever seen? Look at that little lady. I've been teasing you about what is this thing that is digging under the ground in southeast Georgia? That is the southeastern pocket gopher, a very important species down here. And I'm joined by a gentleman that knows a thing or two about southeastern pocket gophers, JT Pine. Good to be with you. Thanks so much for being on the show. JT is a PhD student in the Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources, and we love to collaborate with our friends in Warnell. JT, you're working on a PhD studying that species. What are you doing? What kind of things are you studying about her? We're doing a, a, a kind of a habitat composition and a bunch of other things across their entire range in Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. Okay. Um, and we're looking specifically at doing some statistical sampling to check abundance and other things along those lines. So movement and behavior, and, and I'm noticing your behavior, and you put a glove on, that Definitely. makes me a little bit nervous. 
Are we going to handle her? Of course. All right, let's do it. Come on, get down here. <laughs> so I'm going to stand back for just a second. This is a ferocious rodent here, southeastern pocket gopher. Look at this. So JT's picking her up right behind the lake. So JT caught her last night for our show. Thank you for doing that. We will release her in a second. So look at the face, look at the body, and that mouth wide open. Why do they call them pocket gophers? They have these external fur-lined cheek pockets right here that I'm not going to get my finger too close to because <laughs> hey. they tuck behind those rodent teeth and they can close completely and the teeth will still be out so they can kind of dig that way and they can also store roots that they chew on in those cheek pockets just like a chipmunk would. Really? So they pocket that stuff away, their teeth stay out and they use their teeth to dig as well as their hands? As well as their claws, yes. Wow. So what I want to do is I want to prevent her from getting any more upset. We're going to release her. I'm going to get my glove on. So give me a second. We're going to put her back in the ground so you can see her burrow. So let's do that. <laughs> All right. So let's play a little game. Which hole is she going to go for? <laughs> hole number one, two, or three? I'm going to reach over here and grab her and see what we can do. Come here, girly. Hey, it's okay. Here we got it. Thank you for being on TV with us. See you guys. Let's put her back. Okay, let's see which one. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, we're gonna make a new hole. <laughs> Looks, like Looks like it's door number four, JT says. <laughs> We're releasing her back into the wild. And now what we're gonna talk about next is this idea about how the benefits of them digging in the ground, what that does for trees and forest ecosystems down here in South Georgia. So let's go there next while we wait on her to make up her mind. <laughs> So look at the beauty behind us out here. This is incredible. A longleaf pine ecosystem. We've got some of the babies coming up. We've got the big trees here. This is a place that fire is used to control and encourage growth right here. And we're talking about the Joseph W. Jones Ecological Research Center at Itchaway down here in South Georgia. JT, why should folks care about this special little rodent we've been talking about, the Southeastern Pocket Gopher? What should we know and folks at home know about this thing? Well, the primary thing they do is contribute to understory diversity. So if you look around here, you can see tons of different species of legumes and grasses and even poison ivy or poison oak, <laughs> yeah. which is an awesome species. <laughs> and they really will chew on the roots and do some selective herbivory to bring back a lot of the good species that we want in an area like this. Interesting. And when they feed on those things, the plants respond by putting out more growth and it helps the lushness, I guess, in the understory. Definitely. Now, I've heard that these pocket gophers are like a keystone species, like a gopher tortoise. Is that correct? Definitely. Similar okay. to the gopher tortoise, they have underground burrows. They're a little bit harder to get yeah. into and a lot of their associated species are invertebrates, but there are tons of vertebrate like um, uh, uh, five line lizards and some snake species will use um, the southern pine snake. There you go. I've heard those guys. Yeah. Beautiful snake gets in there. Maybe they could eat what's in the burrow too. The so, gophers are one of the prime uh, food sources for the southern pine snake. And that's a snake that stays underground all the time. Well, JT, thanks for spending time with me today. Thanks for this coming. Is, it's beautiful to be out here. Y'all check out southern Georgia and this place if you can. Y'all know what to do. Check out the Ranger Nick Facebook page and like that and communicate with me that way. And while you're online, check out the Farm Monitor Facebook page and all the things that Ray and Kenny and others have going on. And until next time, I'm go for a drink. It's so hot out here. <laughs> Let's go for one. I'm Ranger Nick reminding you that enthusiasm is contagious. So pass it on. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you back here next month. See ya. Nick, thank you so much. Well, some might call it a magic garden because it's changed the lives of so many UGA students. When we come back, the story on how the U Garden came to be. Dietitians say the U.S. is becoming a more health conscious society, seeking nutrition, but not sacrificing great tasting food. In general with nutrition, because it's such a hot topic, we see a lot of misinformation out there. So we see some myths being uh, recurring about beef. McNeil says some may not know beef has iron, zinc, and B vitamins. However, the number one question the scientist and dietitian gets asked, can beef be part of a heart-healthy diet? And that always surprises me because it's the area of research that we have the most scientific evidence for. Research study after research study show that you can eat beef even every day and lower your cholesterol. This is why.
McNeil says 25 grams of protein is the amount recommended by researchers to keep you full meal to meal. That's about the size of three ounces of beef. Compared to other protein sources, it's a lot of protein and fewer calories. A lot of moms I know, they'll think, well, I want to put peanut butter on toast in the morning. But you'd have to eat two to three times the amount of calories of peanut butter to get the same protein that you're getting from beef. And beef is high quality protein. There are more misconceptions about lean beef, something the beef checkoff is trying to answer. Questions like whether plant-based proteins are better for your health. But a lot of people don't realize that meat proteins like beef, they have about half the calories to get all the same protein and a lot of nutrition. Another misconception, do Americans consume too much protein? And when it comes to beef, we're eating beef right within the recommended levels that American Heart Association recommends or that the dietary guidelines. So beef is actually one of those things we're getting right. It's the fruits and vegetables and all that we need to be eating more of to build a balanced plate. Or is beef a primary source of fat? Fat is not what we once thought it was. There's, it's good to have some fat in your diet. And half of beef's fat is actually monounsaturated fat, the same kind of fat found in olive oil. Well, finally this week, located exactly 3.1 miles from the center of campus, according to Google Maps, the UGA U Garden, pardon the pun, has grown into its own the last decade. Uh. And is now considered a valuable resource for both ag and non-ag students throughout the university. Yeah, Ray, and a lot of credit goes to the farm's manager, whose positive outlook and energy helps keep U Garden growing. So U Garden got started actually about 10 years ago. May was our 10th year anniversary. So it was 2008, and it was started by a group of students who just wanted a place to grow their own food. Um, and they wanted to do it on campus, but people were a little bit nervous about, you know, what is this gonna look like? Are we gonna have to put a building on top? Will there be kids everywhere in front of bulldozers? So they're freaking out. Um, this facility was already here. The um, greenhouses had been built here at that time. This was all animal sciences property, and they had just built a new farm. So the land was kind of being vacated. Um, and rather than let it go to parking lots and all of this, they said, hey, let's just go put those random students out here on South Millage, and they'll be a little bit out of the way, but also kind of tied to horticulture since the greenhouses are here. We are probably around uh, 15 acres um, in totality. We only have about two acres of mixed vegetable production in any given season. We do a lot of crop rotation, so even though we have um, a lot of like acres in total, we're not always farming on them because we're giving the soil rest and rotating through different fields for different seasons. We have some, maybe about an acre of mixed small fruits, blueberries, blackberries, and that sort of thing. We have a small medicinal herb garden where we grow teas. Um, we do shiitake mushrooms. We've got space for student research projects. We're doing a wildflower study. So there's a little bit of everything kind of going on out here. I think it's incredibly valuable because it gives the students a space where they can kind of put what they're learning in the classroom to action. And I think what we've seen from this is like, not only is it a great resource for students who want to farm or who are interested in small scale organic farming or you know, whatever, um, or even horticulture students, but it's a great resource for any student who's just interested in growing food in general. Um, I think the majority of students we've seen out here are actually non-majors. So they're history majors, they're business majors, they're nutrition, they're geography. And when we talk to them like, why did you want to come out here? They said, well, I want to know how to grow food. I grew up in Atlanta. We had, you know, like a subdivision type house, a little postage stamp backyard. I never got to see broccoli growing. I never got to pull a carrot out of the ground. And for our ag students, we often take that for granted because we maybe were like, grow, we grew up like seeing that sort of things, but then we are bringing in students who are just like, I didn't know cabbage grew like that, or I didn't know you know, broccoli was actually like a bud that formed a flower later if you didn't pick it. So I think like the, the most valuable thing I've seen is just getting other students out here exposed to growing food.
All right, that's going to do it for this week's edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. Here's a quick reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm. Be sure you check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and with us on the show. Take care, everybody. We will see you next week right here on the Farm Monitor. As always, have a great week.